Hi, everybody. How are you this evening? First story in art. Yay. Oops. What was that? Crunch, crunch. I was moving things off the desk. I must have balanced something a little bit too precariously because it went crunch. Well, ah, somebody's got a thumbs up. Must be Lupe watching from behind. And But I don't know where everybody else is, but we're going to get rock and rolling tonight. So you like my little rock and roll start. Uh, the stories I, I have, I chose for tonight, um, partially, uh, the, I found three different people, three different continents, three very different lives and different directions of things, but all very creative people and inventive and um, just, you know, make a huge difference in some ways. Also, the artwork in the books are something spectacular. Um there's one that's done in collage type uh, that the pictures are all, it's just beautiful. Then there's another one that is done in kind of almost cartoon like uh, outlines. And then there is the third one that is far more gentle to the setting. So uh, that's what I'm going to go with tonight. And where did this go oh i have something though that i wanted to share first off that bob saved for me um <laughs> i don't know if you're calvin and hobbs fans but he is he always looks at them every day and and different things i always have have been a calvin and hobbs fan but this was the cartoon that he pulled up today that said, um, just a sec, let me get a camera A here. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do a, whoop, where is it? Do I have one? Camera A, there, oh, there it is. There we go, here it is. I will pull it down here. So the literary world is a buzz about Mabel Syrup's sequel to Hamster Huey and the Gooey Kablooey. <laughs> this is the book that Calvin always read. We have to buy it. It's called Commander Coriander Salamander and Er Single Hander Billy Lander. And the dad says, architects should be forced to live in the buildings they design. And children's books authors should be forced to read their stories aloud every single night of their rotten lives. <laughs> I just thought that was great. That is just because I, I, one of the stories tonight is about an architect and <laughs> he's got the both. And then of course this, the children's look, you've all heard the story about us reading Goodnight Sammy every night for 18 months when Annalena was little because it was her favorite, favorite story. Oh yeah, what a way to go. Um, anyway, so let me check something. I'm just going to check something real quick here on my YouTube channel, make sure that this is showing because mm, um, and say if I'm going live, is it, is it, is it, am I live? No comments, so I just, yeah, it seems to be. Let me just check on my channel. Uh, new videos. Do, 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 do. New, hang on, one more home. Uh, ta -da. Trying to see if uh, it's showing up. Did I, yep, I'm live. It's on. It's on showing. Okay, then that's good. Yep, 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 yep. It's there. Not a problem. All right. I just wanted to make sure it was really showing. And now I have to turn it off so I don't get any feedback. There. Whew. All right, so we got stories tonight, and I'm going to get rocking and rolling for these because they are some fun stories. Hi, Lupe! Yay, I thought you might be. 
Um, let me turn this camera off for the stories. And uh, I might turn it back on for the, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Okay, here we go for the first one. So the far, first one is called Frank Who Liked to Build. This is it. And what is that? There, that is that. Yeah, here it is. Frank Who Liked to Build. And it is the architecture of Frank Gehry. And I think this is going to be a fun one. Um, it was just really interesting. I've got some, just the idea of the different architects and what uh, people and how they went about their creativity and, and what they did to do that. It is by Deborah Blumenthal and illustrated by Maria Brzezowska. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Frank, who liked to build. I'll move myself into the middle here and down some. The architecture of Frank Gehry. So this is the North American continent person that I have for the stories. Imagine a building with a sloping silver skin that seemed to shiver in the wind, or another with billowy blanket walls big enough to hide a family of dinosaurs. Wow. And who made them? Frank Geary, an architect. Some of his buildings look like he designed them while dreaming or standing on his head like a kid having fun. One has titanium walls like unrolled aluminum foil. Another has giant glass sails enclosing an iceberg. Imagine tossing building blocks into a blender and pureeing them because Frank has, was different from other people and so are his buildings. The curve and swerve and undulate like swimming fish flowing with time and light. Frank started with ordinary and shaped it into extraordinary. When he was small, his grandma, Leah, gave him bits of wood from a sack for his wood stove, and off he went, creating little cities and different worlds. Frank's father wasn't impressed. He thought I was a dreamer, Frank said. He didn't think I would amount to anything. Neither did my mother. Those thoughts haunted him his whole life. But dreamers keep dreaming and playing. Boulders that collide with drenching colors that steal your sight, blinding you with brilliance. Frank made rooftops that bend and sway. Life sometimes gets in the way of art, though. Frank was Jewish, and Jewish faced prejudice in Canada, where he grew up, and in Los Angeles, where he went to architecture school. So he changed his Jewish name, Goldberg, to Gary, but it pained him to do so. What he didn't lose were the memories like the chunks of dough his grandma would give him to play with when she was baking challah. And became, that became Frank's homemade clay, so he could change the shape of things. And the live fish she brought from uh, at the market dropped into the bathtub to stay fresh. Frank was hypnotized by their water ballet. Only when he was older did he realize the carp that disappeared from the bathtub went into the gavelta fish. Ooh. When he became an architect, Frank kept those fish alive in his fish lamps, in his curving and swerving jewelry, and in giant fish sculptures with shiny skin. And maybe the graceful way the carp swam and swam and his love of sailing and the water explain the curves in his buildings, 
like the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. The fun foundation uh, the foundation louis vuitton in paris and the iac office building in new york with its billowing glass sails the buildings are all different but they started out the same sketches that look like squiggly scribbles done in airports and hotel rooms whenever Frank had a free moment. Then came the models. No fancy materials, just cardboard or wood to study, play, and invent with. Frank changed them again and again, scratching his head until he got it right. But even after the buildings were built, Frank still had doubts. The first time he saw the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, he thought, what have I done to these people? Still, he kept working, using metal and chain mail fencing, glass and stone, turning old into new, turning life on its head. He used scraps of whatever was around, paper, towel rolls, pleated cardboard, even glass bottles studying, playing, inventing, dreaming, seeing possibilities, starting with ordinary and shaping it into extraordinary, one building at a time. It says the author's note, Frank Gehry's buildings don't look like buildings. They look like art projects made by someone who got carried away playing with shapes, lines, colors, and dazzling assortment of materials. Gary's architecture stuns, it shocks, it takes your breath away. My reaction to seeing a Gary design always brings me back to my first look at the Grand Canyon. I fell silent, transported to a higher place. Some of the most respected architects in the world are Gary's biggest fans. When Philip Johnson first saw Gary's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, he began to sob. I get the same feeling in, Charles Cathe in, in Char Chartres Cathedral, he said. He called Gary the greatest architect we have today, and the Guggenheim Bilbao as the greatest building of our time. At the world's Jewish museum in Tel Aviv, Gary talked about how his Jewish identity helped inspire his work. When I was a kid, my grandfather read Tal Talmud to me, and that stuck with me because it started with the word why. The curiosity that we've been raised with, all of us from childhood, is what makes us produce. To make things, you have to be curious and wonder. Why and explore and be willing to take chances and risks. Mm. But it's the torn, it's, it's from that basic curiosity that is so eloquently written about in the Talmud. The works of Frank Gehry, the most famous architect, or architect in the world, can be seen all over the globe. Each one is fresh, brash, energetic, fascinating, and unique. They may start out as squiggles and sketches, but the latest digital technology turns them into stone and steel. Still, what's most important to Gary isn't what comes out of a computer. A life-size photograph of a Greek statue of a, ch a charioteer from 500 BCE is outside Gary's office. In an interview with Forbes magazine in 2015, he said, That unknown artist did a statue that made me cry. How did he do that? That's our goal. Emotion. In 1989, Frank O'Gary received the Pritzker Ar Architecture Prize, the Nobel Prize, the Nobel of Architecture, given for a lifetime of achievement. But back then, at the age of 60, he was only getting started. Uh, the illustrator Maria Broskowski was born in Poland and spent most of her childhood growing up in Turkey, where she now lives. A graduate at Leeds Art University, I have a friend that's there at Leeds Art University right now, in the United Kingdom. 
She's a visual story storyteller who enjoys taking poetic approach to her art, and she uses traditional painting techniques aided by digital methods. And the author is an award-winning journalist and has the author of 25 books for adults and children. Wow. Yes. I know. Isn't it beautiful? Just absolutely stunning architecture. Absolutely stunning. Ah. So many different things that go into what we do do as creatives and how it brings about and those scribbles. I love that he starts with scribbles in a sketchbook because sometimes that's all I feel like my sketchbooks are or my photographs are, are some of them are the equivalent of scribbles. They're, they're not things that I would necessarily show or produce, but they're the start. They're the scribble start. Excuse me why. Took a long drink of water. Okay, the next book I'm going to is about a woman um, that uh, influenced so many people in so many ways and not only influenced her own industry but in influenced uh, music and whatnot. And every, it's just, just a, a big name and it's a, these great series of books called Little People Big Dreams are a really cool series that they're they're like a great biography for kids that break down different people. This one is written by M. Isabel Sanchez Vigara and it's illustrated by Laura Callahan. And this is the story. Oh, the architecture looks like your neuro art. Hey, thanks, Lupe. Yeah, that, you know, that kind of scribble really does find, I have found doing that um, a little bit Either that or just watercoloring a bit or playing with paint. I have the time each day now that I'm doing that during a practice not perfect time. And it's very nice. It's nice and settling. But anyway, this book is in this series. Um, and this is the book that has just, I mean, the art in it is this just great outline art. And that it's just so expressive. And this is called... Little People, Big Dreams, and this is the story of Vivian Westwood. This whole series uh, of books um, about, there's so many different ones, and are just great little biographies. So Vivian Westwood, Little People, Big Dreams. Little Vivian lived in a little town called Titwistle in England. She was born during a great war, world war, and while her mom darned her socks, she dreamed of mending the world. At school, there was a boy all the children bullied. They called him Dirty Edward, but Vivian didn't. She always stood up for the outsiders. She told everyone she was his girlfriend, even though it wasn't true. When Vivian was older, her family moved to the outskirts of London. Vivian was always curious about art and new ideas, so she decided to study fashion and jewelry design. Making a living as an artist was difficult, so Vivian pursued a career in teaching. <laughs> she liked being a teacher, but her head and heart were elsewhere. One day, she met a rebellious young man named Malcolm McLaren. They opened a shop on the King's Road in London, where they mixed rock and roll records with fashion in a brand new way. Vivian took apart old clothes from the 1950s to create new designs. She started ripping the garments before thre threading them with safety pins and writing shocking statements on every t-shirt.
clothes became her way to speak out and protest. Bands took notice, and soon she was dressing musicians with chains and collars. Her style was as loud and chaotic as the new sound in town. Punk. With their next collection, Vivian and Malcolm sailed away from King's Road and docked on the catwalk. They plundered ideas from the past and dressed models as pirates and buccaneers. It was an anti-fashion revolution. After years together, Vivian felt it was time to go out on her own way and said goodbye to Malcolm. She was about to change the shape of women's clothes with her corsets and bubble skirts. Many critics found Vivian's clothes unwearable, but she was not interested in their opinions. She would much rather read a good book than any fashion magazine. Vivian mixed punk and aristocracy, making the poor look rich and the rich look poor. She dressed artists, actresses, and even some members of royalty. Vivian became an activist against climate change. She made quality clothes that were built to last, encouraging people to buy less and wear them more. And little Vivian, who always stood up for the outsiders, became the most unique and outspoken fashion designer ever. All because she believes that those who dare to speak up can change the world. Here's some pictures of her. Vivian Westwood is one of the most famous outspoken fashion designers in the world. She was born in the north of England to a family with a long history of shoemaking. Um, but there were no other signs of the future fashion Viv icon Vivian would grow, would become. When she was 17, she was born in 1941. When she was 17, her family moved to Harrow on the outskirts of London. There she worked at a local factory and trained to be a teacher while making jewelry on the side, selling it in a stall on Portobello Road in London. However, her life changed when she met the man named Malcolm McLaren. She was suddenly introduced to a world of art, politics, and freedom. Together they opened a clothes shop at number 430 Kings Road in London. Vivian designed clothes for sale, emblazoning t-shirts with shocking statements, ripping up fabrics, and using everyday objects like safety pins as decoration. She created a new style based on being nonconformist. Their shop became an important place for the punk movement in the 1970s, and Vivian clothed the most famous punk bands of the time. Vivian eventually left Malcolm and established her own identity as a fashion designer. She created a fashion empire with key pieces that revolutionized tra traditional fabrics and styles like tartan, tweed, crinoline, corsets, and knitwear. Vivian is also a passionate climate change activist, believing that fashion can make a difference in the world. Her motto is to buy less, choose well, and make it last. As my mom always said, fix it up, wear it out, make it do until you sort it out or do without my mom always said that was my mom <laughs> um, in 2006 she was made dame commander of the order of the british empire the dbe and has since been described as the coco chanel of our day she now designs clothes to make people feel grand and strong whoever they are so this is that series uh, books. They have little board books for little kids. My Angelo Coco Chanel all in board books that are these great ones. And they have books and paper dolls. And then they have a whole series from Frida Kahlo, Coco Chanel, Maya Angelo, Amelia Earhart, Agatha Christie, Marie, Mary Curie, George O'Keefe, Josephine Baker, Mother Teresa, Muhammad Ali, who just, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, Maria Montessori, Simone de Bouvier, all these, Jane Goodall, 
wonderful books. They're, they're just a great, simple introduction to kids and about famous people and the different things that they made, they, that they have done and how they have become and what they've done. I think it's cool. So that's that one. And I have, where did it go? There's one more. So the last book that I have takes us to Africa. And this book is about a young Maasai uh, who was in charge, like all young Maasai children are between the ages of six and nine, of taking care of the herd and making sure it is protected and watched over during the day. I have gone on, and, and this is something that this, uh, I, today I watched part of a TED talk that this young man did, and it was pretty amazing to, to listen to him. And so this book is called Lion Lights. My Invention That Made Peace with Lions by Richard Touré and Shelley Pollock. Richard Touré is the, the boy in this and illustrated by Sonia Posenthal. And again, this is a very different kind of illustration, much more of a almost um, a realistic watercolor type of thing. I cannot tell. Yeah. My invention that made peace with the, with lions. That's the cover, Lion Lights. Um, what is that sound? Is it the wind rustling the tall grass? Or is it what I fear most? Lions. Lions lurking waiting to leap and kill my father's cows. The cows are my family's meat, milk, and hides. They are our family's wealth, and my job is to protect them. I must not fail. I am nine years old. That nine-year-old boy was me not so long ago. Now I, Richard Touré, I'm older, but I remember how scared I was back then. My family's farm borders the south side of Nairobi National Park in Kenya, where wild animals roam, and those animals include the king of them all, the lions. Lions need food, and a cow is much easier to grab than a zippy zebra. There you go. My family are Maasai. Once our people roam Kenya's plains with our cows and goats, moving with the dry and wet seasons to find good grass. Now we live in small villages called Manyatas, but we still have to protect our herds from lions. When I was six, I began tending the cows, and I began tending our sheep and goats. Three years later, my father chose me to herd the cattle. It was a great honor. In the dry season, our animals need to graze far from the farm to find pasture and water, and I had to herd them home again each night. I missed a lot of school, and when I did go to classes, it was hard to stay awake. I watched planes flying overhead and dreamed of being in a plane myself, exploring the world. Each night I herded our cows into their boma. It's, it spent a thorny acacia branches, kept the cattle inside, but couldn't keep the lions out, no matter how tall and sturdy we tried to build it. The lions couldn't see the cows, but they could smell them. Like other Maasai herders, I tried many ploys to keep the lions away. I built fires fueled by cow dung outside the boma. 
but lions walked around or between the flames. I made a scarecrow. It worked the first night, but lions are smart. They weren't fooled for long by my simple trick. Long ago, a Maasai boy had to kill a lion with a spear in order to become a warrior. That time passed, but not was not forgotten. Desperate Maasai farmers still speared lions or even poisoned them. Tourists come from all over the world to see Kenya's wild animals. That would end if the lions disappeared. Wildlife conservationists tried to find an answer. The government tried paying farmers for dead cows, but the payments were too small. They tried building chain link fences and providing guard dogs, but that was too expensive. Lions kept killing cows and Maasai herders kept killing lions. I was always curious. While other boys played warriors and lions, I tinkered with electronic gadgets. Without books or anyone to help me, I had to teach myself. To learn, I took everything apart. <laughs> Once I broke open my family's TV to see if the people inside were real. Hmm. My mother was even more upset the day I took her new radio apart. But I learned a lot about electronics. When I was 11 years old, a morning came when I started hating lions. I found my father's only bull dead inside the boma. That meant we'd have to buy another bull or borrow one from another farm to get new calves. It was like waking up in the morning to find that you've lost everything. All your savings are gone. I knew that I then that I had to outsmart the lions or end up hating them, but how? No one in Africa had found a solution. How could I? When I walked around the boma with a flashlight, I noticed that the lions stayed away. They were afraid of my moving light, but I couldn't guard the cows every night. I needed to be sleeping in my bed. If only my flashlight could move by itself. Hmm. Then I had an idea. Huh. I knew something about how electronics worked. Maybe I could use my knowledge to trick those prowlers. Okay. I gathered parts. I came upon a smashed up flashlight with a light bulb. I found a discarded turn signal flasher from a small motorcycle. I found a switch. I borrowed bits of wire. My father gave me an old car battery that I had had to carry to and from town to charge every two days, a three kilometer walk, hike each way. Hmm. I tried many experiments. I gave myself and my little brother electric shocks. <laughs> my parents built a small shed to get my constant tinkering out of the house. They didn't think my ideas would work Neither did our neighbors, but each failure gave me a chance to ask why and try again. Yeah, borrowed cow. Finally, when I was 12, I was ready to put everything together. I wound bits of wire around the Bulma's fence posts, then twisted flashlight bulbs into the circuit. I aimed the bulbs outward where lions lurked. I connected the bulbs to a switch. As night fell, I flipped the switch, my heart beating fast. First one small bulb flashed, then the next one, then the next. One by one, all around the boma, lights flashed, and the lions stayed away. They must have thought my whole family was walking around. But would they catch on to this trick like they had the scarecrow? 
The next night, I waited and watched again. The lights blinked on and off, on and off. And all night long, the lions stayed away. My lights worked. They worked the next night and the night after that, too. I slept well. I called my invention Lion Lights. Word spread quickly. Soon my neighbors wanted Lion Lights, too. I did not realize the importance of my little invention or how my life was about to change. One day, some important people came to see me. They, too, were amazed by what I had done. They said no one had ever thought of this. My homemade lion lights had cost less than $10 to make. They were simple, quick to install, and movable. I had saved our family's cows, which is a Maasai warrior's duty. Now my lights are being used around the world. And best of all, I finally outsmarted the lions. <laughs> Goes on, tells some, it get, this is nice because it gives a background on the Maasai and how they've changed and how their uh, culture has changed from being so nomadic to where they are now. Um, and what they're doing. Urban Maasai people return home whenever possible to wear the shuka and sandals and honor their proudful, beautiful, ageless traditions. So this goes on. Maasai farmers tried many ways to keep their cows safe. As Richard tells in his story, nothing worked. Not fences, dogs, scarecrows, torn anything. Richard's simple and elegant invention, Lion Light, solved a problem that had defeated experts. Many Maasai have moved from the countryside to Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, and other cities looking for jobs. Those who have remained on their farms, like Richard's family, augment their income with gardens of maize, beans, rice, and other crops. Many Maasai have become entrepreneurs, guiding safaris or selling beads, masks, and wood carvings to tourists. And this is great. It has Maasai words and more on on resources. This is just a great book about him. And it says, Richard Ture, he is a, now a, an undergraduate student at the African Leadership University, where he is studying global challenges with a focus of wildlife conservation. Richard shared his lion lights with the world at the TED Global Stage in California. Oh, that's the TED Talk I watched today. He received a special commendation from Africa Leadership Awards for his critical role in protecting and creating awareness around crisis facing lions in Kenya. He is recognized as Kenya's youngest patent inventor and in 2018 received the Anzashi Prize Award. In 2020, he became a National Geographic Young Explorer, and he was a finalist in the Future for Nature Awards. In 2021, oh, and, and, and for Future Nature Awards in 2021, he got that, he, and has a website. Um, Shelley Pollock taught remedial reading and math to children and adults in the U.S. for 25 years. She hopes that Lion Lights, her debut picture book, will inspire children everywhere to realize that no matter how young they are, they may be, or how big their challenges, they may accomplish anything. And Sonia Marie Luce Posentini is an award-winning illustrator in Modena, Italy, and a professor of illustration at the International School of Comics in Reggio Emilia. She has illustrated 13 children's books, including Night Creatures and Hold On to Your Music. Ah, yay. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Lupe. I'm glad you liked them. I did. I These were three that I, it just, I, I didn't think I, I was not, I thought, I, and I always kind of like to get a theme sort of with the books and they go together. And I thought, oh, I want to read these. I'd, and then I looked at them again and I thought, hold it. These are all very, 
who looked at things differently, who looked at things from, um, oh, Tamara, hi, that's okay. That There are three people who, who took an outside the box, a different look at things and really made a huge significant difference. I mean, Frank Gehry and his architecture, geez, to, to the things that he makes things look like and what he does and from his scribbles, how he sees and Vivian Westwood, oh, oh my gosh, and continues to do as she does today. And then this young boy, young man now, solving a problem that nobody else had but it was important to his family. A new way of becoming a Maasai warrior. He protected the herd in a different way, this time without a spear, but with a light. Pretty cool, I think. Yay. So that's my stories for tonight. Sunday will be show 500. I'm going tomorrow to put a, I think I'll put a post in my, in YouTube in the post sections there in the community posts and you can share it with people if you'd like. And uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna go back and I'll probably, Skippy will come to visit. Uh, maybe um, Tacky might come to visit. Um, some different books and send in illus uh, artwork from you guys. Just, yeah, that's what I wanna show show some of your artwork and what we've done. I'll, I'll think I'll, uh, I know 500, 500 shows of doing this 500 nights. Whoa, pretty crazy, pretty crazy. <sighs> Yay. That's so good. I think the two of you have been here from very close to the beginning, very close. Anyway, that's it for tonight. I'm going to, uh, um, head on up and hang out with Bob, uh, where I, oh, news, we found somebody to do the electrics for the shed and we got somebody to dig the trench. I mean, geez, all kinds of things happening together. So, um, yeah, but if you get a chance, go, uh, check that Ted talk. I was going to get his, the, the link, but I couldn't, I can't find, I don't have it now, but anyway. For now, Sunday, send your artwork in. Let's have a show, have some books, have some celebrations, um, cheer on, uh, have lots of, send me your most favorite book that you remember and email it to me, send me something like that, and I'll add it into the show. We're going to have a good time. It'll be just kind of fun party time and some good stories. So then, until next time, everybody. Huh. See if I can do it right tonight and not just finish. I hit the wrong button last week and it just cut everything off. I didn't even have my outro. Keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. It's all around you, everybody. But the first place you'll find it is when you go look in the mirror. And I'll see you Sunday. And there. <laughs> In the heat of the night, 